Hey, what's up everyone? Emilio here with Heal and Deploy and the Moken brand. Today I'm covering Wingbits, super high project right now. Everybody's paying attention to it in the deep in space, but not a lot of people understand what the hell they do. <laughs> if you ask most people, they'll tell you they track planes, but what do you mean they track planes? Like as if planes are not currently tracked? That doesn't really make sense. You know, planes are mostly tracked. So let's dive right into it. So essentially like currently the way we track planes is using these big systems. They're super good very expensive and hard to deploy. They're worth about seven to 10 million each, super bulky, hard to deploy. So what's the issue? Well, we can deploy a lot of them um, in areas where we have them. You know, we have one radar here, for example, we have another radar here, we can have another radar here, and any plane in that area will get tracked. Even plane in that area will get tracked by two radars, this one and this one. Planes in that area will get tracked by multiple radars. Boom, boom, boom. But as soon as you leave their zone, like here, for example, no more tracking. Bam, plane disappears. And why does that happen? Well, simply put, because of the way these radar work. So these radar are, can send a signal very far, but cannot pass concrete stuff. And concrete stuff could be like the earth. So, you know, you have a radar here, okay? Let's say plane is here, for example. The signal goes super far, but the issue is that it doesn't pass through concrete stuff. And since the, the planet is curved, curved, this is a curve, this is me trying to curve something, essentially. The signal cannot pass through the earth. So you're not getting a reception. You're not seeing the plane that's here. You can only see signals that are straight. So straight line, boom. Straight line, we're gonna see it. So the plane could be here, we're gonna see it. But obviously again, because the planet is curved, the plane is here and going uphill, up up Earth, should I say. So not going to be seen. So these are cases where we're not seeing the planes, we're missing them. Um, in other cases, it could be a mountain. You have a radar here, there's a mountain here. And the mountain actually creates a dead zone here, boom. So any plane that's in that zone will not be seen. So planes here, no problem, here. Good, check mark, good. Planes here, no no bueno, we're not gonna see you. So in these cases, we have instances where we're not tracking planes anymore. And so does that happen? You know, does that really happen? Is there instances where planes are not being tried? What actually the scary truth is that there's on a daily basis, there's thousands of planes not being tracked. And now I hear you out. You're like, wow, does that mean when I travel to New York um, and I'm, looking at New York City from my, my, my plane, they're not tracking us, we're, we're flying under the radar. Well, not exactly. So in New York, uh, it's one of these cases where you have like many, many radars. You have a radar at every single corner of New York. So you're being overly tracked over there. You have, a, you have multiple radars. There's not a single centimeter in New York that you're not being tracked. So in, in instances like New York, it's probably a case like these where you have three radars covering it and you're probably getting tracked by multiple radars. So there's no, there's no dead zones in New York, not really. But where does that really happen? It's gonna be in instances uh, like uh, the Rocky Mountains. So Rocky Mountains, small airport, not a lot of uh, people using it. Um, can't deploy uh, these 5 million radars, you know, at every corner of these mountains. So these mountains are blocking signals. So um, since they're blocking signal and we can deploy these very expensive devices at every corner of these mountains, we're going to have dead zones. There's going to be areas where there's going to be no planes tracked. Um, same with the Southwest desert. Um, you know, if there's a mountain here, plane is, plane is behind the mountain. We're not seeing it. We don't have enough. It, it's not dense enough in terms of usability of an airport for the airport to justify uh, an investment of, you know, five, seven million to track of planes over there. Same goes with the Nepal airport, which is deemed as one of the most dangerous places to ever take a plane. A significant percentage of the planes were not being tracked at the Nepal airport. So these are instances where plane tracking goes off radar. So how how do we deal with instances where, you know, we can't deploy uh, a radar $5 million here and another $5 million here and another $5 million there? five million dollar here so we use what we call these smaller uh uh flight radar that are called adsb 
base ground receiver. So these receivers could be deployed by anyone essentially. Super easy to deploy. They cost around like 500 bucks ish. Deploy them on your rooftop and these ADSB receivers supplement the bigger flight radar. So it's, so currently flights are being tracked by two things. So to recap, they're being tracked by these bulky big ones. These are super good but they're being supplemented by these ADSB base ground receivers. So these base receivers are deployed in areas like uh, the Nepal airport where you know you can't justify multiple uh, five million dollar investments so you deploy an ADSB receiver here, another one here, another one here maybe and obviously that's behind the mountains. So you guys get the idea. So I want to jump into how big is that market. So according to Wingbits, they think that market is worth $22 billion. I've seen different figures. I've seen some places where they claim that that market is worth $5 billion. But um, you, know, you, you can never know with these numbers. But that just says that the market is pretty big. So let's go back to who deployed these ADSB based ground receiver? It's a network mainly deployed by a network that's called Flight Radar. So, Flight Radar, if uh, you just type it, Flight Radar. So, Flight Radar is leveraging a bunch of, and, and, and by the way, as soon as you hit the website, it's so clunky, you feel it's like old school. But, anyways, that's not the point. The point is that this network is the main network where you will find ADSB ground receivers. These are the same unit that Wingbits is actually deploying. The current leader in that space is Flight Radar. And believe it or not, they are being supplemented by hobbyists. It's not people that are getting paid to deploy these things. It's really hobbyists that actually have a, a passion for for flight flight tracking in that space that are deploying the, these ADSB receivers and they're connecting their hardware to, to flight radar so the issue is that is that you might you might get gaps where there's no enthusiast that's really down for that over there and it's really hard to incentivize him because there's no crypto incentive so that's what you get um when you connect to that network it's it works kind of well although it's a little bit clunky and you feel it's old school but Overall, uh, it works kind of well, but you might get caps, gaps, should I say. And you also might get um, some of these hobbyists might not have their unit online. They might have it offline for some, some amount of time. They might took a trip down south and left their ADSB receiver offline. And there's not really a big incentive for them to keep it online if ever the network needs it. So that's some of these issues that flight radar can run into. But overall, I got to say, flight radar has been doing pretty good even though it's enthusiasts that backs up the network and deploy these devices, it has been doing so amazingly good, honestly, impressively well. Um, just this September, September 6, 2025, uh, a private equity firm acquires a stake in Flight Radar, Flight Radar 24 for a deal worth $500 million. So that private equity firm valued Flight Radar for $500 million. So that's not bad. Uh, for a network that's built on the backbone of enthusiasts, flight enthusiasts. So that's really good. And that's one of the reasons why Wingbits saw that as an opportunity. They're like, wow, if these guys were able to build a whole network based on enthusiasts who just want to share their data and they're worth today $500 million, what can we do if we add a crypto incentive to the whole game? So that's what Wingbits is currently eyeing. They're eyeing a crypto incentive for the people who want to be part of the network and what they think will happen is that they will get better coverage because now they're they can close gaps you know when you look at flight radar they they definitely have gaps across the globe maybe in south america here clearly there's gaps uh, maybe in africa there's gaps and maybe in other places in the world there's gaps where there's not a big incentive for these people to deploy devices here so with Wingbits, because there's an incentive they can maybe get that zone and, and have a multiplier and make sure that this zone gets covered drastically quickly. Um, so that's one of the uh, that's one of the edges that Wingbits could get. The other thing is obviously, as I covered earlier, the reli reliability. Uh, if people are not getting paid or there's no incentive, well, maybe keeping it online is not that great of a, uh, you know, maybe keeping it online might be a little bit complex. If you go on a trip and uh, no one could watch over your ADSB receiver, then it's just going to go offline. The other thing is that it's on-chain data. It's it's using the new crypto incentive and it's all the data is on-chain, so it cannot be tampered with. So that's another advantage of using crypto. And obviously the other one, 
uh, that I put in bold and big is that it's faster. You can deploy devices super fast, leveraging the deep in innovation. And that's exactly what we've seen. So currently, they're the fastest growing air tracking network in the world. They, they've, they have 5,000 devices deployed already, making them the, the fastest growing in their industry. So, But 5,000 is still not where they want to be at. There's still a lot of holes. They need a lot of uh, devices deployed. To give you a comparative figure, Flight Radar is at 40K deployed. 40K. So they're at 5,000. Flight Radar, the leader, is at 40K. Not bad, very fast, but still a lot of de devices still to be deployed. Um, the other thing that uh, I find interesting about Wingbits, uh, and since we're talking about their traction, uh, they've raised so far uh, $9.2 million in total with their most recent round for $5.6 million in 2025 another cool thing just to show how serious these guys are that really impressed me so they've launched in partnership with spacex a satellite that will supplement their flight tracking data so they're gonna get flight tracking data from the ground with their adsb receiver but another one supplemented with satellites that's really cool um so that just shows uh how serious they are and how um, they're thinking about it. So maybe uh, that doesn't change much to the coverage or to the people who are deploying, but really cool stuff here. The other thing is I like to always look at the team. Who's behind the network and how serious are they? The project is being run by two co-founders from Stockholm. Uh, I personally speak with Robin sometimes. Super cool guy, uh, very responsive, only good stuff. I've never met his co-founder, so I can't speak about his co-founder. But the other thing that I like to look at is how active are they on Discord with their community and how pumped is the community themselves? Is the community healthy? Are people pumped? Because... As always, when you join a crypto project, you're not joining it in um, in a solo mode. You're actually being, you're actually joining a group. You're joining a movement, and you want to make sure that the movement is healthy. They're responsive to one another. So if you have trouble, you can always rely on them to maybe help you answer questions. Um, and the other thing you want to see the project themselves, maybe the, uh, the founders, maybe moderators, being super. Uh, communicative with the community and that's exactly what we see with wingbits honestly if you just go uh in their channel um let me just pull up their channel so yeah so if you go into their discord on the wingbits discord and you just pull up their channel you'll you'll kind of see a lot of people who are interacting I'll, I'll let you dig in on your own time but i'm just doing a quick glance here and it's pretty busy it's the people who are interacting and helping each other for questions that's always a good sign it's clearly not made up of bots, which is always a good sign. We've seen so many crypto projects filled with bots and oh, that's so cringe. So very happy to see that these are real people. Again, I think they have a, a place for pictures uh, to show their setup, which I think is super cool. Um, it just shows that people are interacting. Let me just pull up. Yeah. Spot a photo. So people are sharing their setup. So that's always a good thing. The other data point that I like to peek at is the Moken form. So if you go on Moken, we survey people on the Moken forum and we ask them to rate projects. So out of all the projects, CBRS is the last one. Last, Of course, we know why. Wingbits is number two, right behind GeoNet, so 4.6. So that's always a good sign. So that was it for Wingbits. I hope that was insightful. That was clear. If you have any questions, comment and we'll try to answer them. Thank you all for listening and happy mining.